OK. Um, we are now at the part of the course. <coughs> We're coming up to, to fairly modern times. The, uh, it's been a very breathless run from six million years of chimpanzee evolution through many few million years of human evolution. And we're coming up to more or less the 1960s, which is <coughs> the period of the, the, the greatest percentage increase in human population on Earth ever. Uh, so this is the peak of what's called the population explosion. And we're going to be talking about that till almost the end uh, of the term now. So I have to tell you uh, a little bit uh, truth in, truth in uh, teaching or something. How I got interested uh, in this topic. When I was uh, just a little bit older than you are now, I uh, did the fairly usual thing of going, putting on my short pants and going around the world around Asia anyway, uh, with almost no money in my pocket. And uh, you all, if you have never done that, you should do it, definitely. And after you graduate college, it was a great time to do it. And one of the places I went to was Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong at that time, there were huge numbers of people coming out of China. China was still extraordinarily poor at the time. And any time anybody could leave, they <coughs> left. And so Hong Kong was incredibly crowded uh, with very poor people. And it's still incredibly uh, crowded place, of course. And migrants are still uh, coming out, uh, if they can. <coughs> so one of the, uh, wh where were these people going to live? There were uh, hillsides with shanty towns, uh, lots and lots of shanty towns. But also, the, the, the it's right on the ocean. It's an island. Uh, part of it's an island. So the water is free. So many people were living in little sampans, <coughs> little boats called sampans, in, just in the harbor, docked sort of almost anywhere. And uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. And one of my friends, I had a number of Chinese friends, uh, took me to s look at the boats. And it was interesting. I, you know, I, I wasn't yet really interested in demography, but I couldn't help notice that basically every boat had a, a little girl on it, 11, 12, 13 or something. Uh, maybe younger, and then uh, we got invited on uh, the boat, one of the first bo one of the boats, and uh, you know people were extremely polite, even though very poor, very polite, and you know a lot of bowing and shaking hands for my part, <laughs> and uh, they wanted to offer me something, a little bit of tea, a little bit of, of rice cake, you know they're just as wonderful as they could be, and I noticed that when something had to be done, like the tea had to be gotten or this that or the other thing, it was that little girl that was doing all the work. And OK, so what? That's you know, one of the kids. That's, you know, it's good for kids to have some chores. And then since you know, they didn't have television or a lot of entertainment, and here was this Westerner, and they weren't so used to seeing a lot of Westerners on their boats, I sort of got passed from boat to boat. When you go walking around the world, that's a very good thing. If you go to places where they don't see Westerners, you can get passed on very easily. So in boat after boat, and this phenomenon repeated itself that there was this little girl in every boat, and she seemed to be doing all the work. And so finally, I asked my, my friends, you know, what's, what's going on here? And it was a little hard to get the information out of them. But in actual fact, it was a form of, uh, shall we say, family population control, that uh, the, there, this was a non-contracepting population, so children just kept coming. And they couldn't support the number of children that they had. And they did not value girls very much. So what they did is basically they sold the girls from one boat to the next boat. And then the little girls uh, were basically servants. Again, you can use the word slave if you want. But servants in whatever boat they had been uh, sold to. And some money uh, uh, changed hands, of course, all illegal. Because Hong Kong was then under British uh, rules. I mean, it's legal almost everywhere anyway. Um, and uh, they were just working, doing as much work as could be gotten out of them. Well, that was very sad, um, but wasn't a disaster because you know everybody was living very poorly. Then later, same trip, uh, with my medical connections, I got to tour one of the big British built Queen Elizabeth Hospital, one of these big inner big city hospitals that had ward after ward. 
And one of the things I was taken to see, tuberculosis was a very big problem back then. Leprosy was a problem, tuberculosis was a problem. So I did something stupid with leprosy. I visited, there was a leper colony on an island off Hong Kong, and they were constructing stuff. And uh, you know, I cannot stand around while people are working and me not, so I grabbed a pitchfork, um, uh, a pickaxe, and started working with them. And of course, the pickaxe is rough. Uh, it's uh, made of not terribly well polished wood. And there I was, banging away with it, and it rubs whatever. So uh, <coughs> uh, leprosy is a bacteria that gets into your skin, and the only way to get it is to get that leprosy into your skin. So, so the lepers had been working with it and rubbing it into their skin, and they were uh, rubbing it <laughs> into the wood of the axe and then onto me. I did not get, I, I was really stupid in retrospect, but <laughs> you know, you do a lot of stupid things. <laughs> um, and I did not catch leprosy, and, and in fact, by that time, uh, most, they had a drug, uh, an antibiotic against leprosy, and most of the lepr leprosy bacillus in these people was dead. So it probably wasn't quite as dangerous as, 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 as it might have been. Anyway, I did not catch leprosy. Sorry, so you can shake my hand and so forth. <laughs> but the people there, you know, had the old, th this is an aside, but it's about poverty, and so I'll tell you. So leprosy affects the nerve cells, and it doesn't make, directly make your fingers or nose fall off, but you don't feel wounds, so you don't, because you don't have the nerve cells. So you don't take care of wounds, and eventually the fingers get infested and, and infected, and damage, kept damage is kind of constant, and, and parts of you fall off, actually. But it's not the leprosy bacteria itself, which only attacks nerves. It's the damage that you're not, pay, you're not noticing, you're not aware of. So, <coughs> okay, sorry, that was an excursion. So leprosy was a big thing in Hong Kong at the time, as was tuberculosis. And in the big British hospital, I, I went in, and, and one of the things I saw was huge wards, you know, big places, with, again, I saw a ward full of these just pubescent or prepubescent girls, and they all had TB. And then there was two or three of these wards, actually, so a very large number of girls there. And I said, what's going on? You know, and then the story, the full story came out, that yes, indeed, <coughs> there's a lot of selling uh, of, the, of the children between boats, and, and yes, they work. And because they're underfed and overworked, and, and TB is rampant, these girls get tuberculosis. And then what happens is uh, they take him to the health station, and, and the, the doctors say, you gotta build up this girl, and they give them milk powder. The milk powder's taken home. What do you think they do with the milk powder? Given to the boy child, right? So the girl gets sicker, and then she's getting quite sick, and she's brought back, and now she's given medicine, uh, antibiotic, and guess what happens with the medicine? taken to the market, sold, money is used to boy rice or, or milk <coughs> for, the, for the boy children. Eventually, so TB, as you, you're probably aware, gets the lungs. It can also get in the long bones of the body. And eventually it infects the long bones, and the long bones start, there are huge amounts of pus builds up, and eventually it breaks through the skin. So what someone who has a child with this kind of long bone uh, uh, tuberculosis sees basically pus, the skin eventually breaks and the pus starts pouring out, and uh, the, the parents are terribly afraid, and they're afraid for their biological kids, their biological sons especially. So as soon as this happens to the girl, they just d dump her at the British, at, at whatever the public <coughs> hospital is, and, um, I, and, and they just, just abandon them uh, there. And what the doctors told me was that uh, the girls are now 13 or 14, the, lep the uh, tuberculosis is so far gone uh, that there's nothing they can do when the girls die. So this was, you know, my first introduction to that nexus of uh, extreme poverty, uh, extreme over d crowded conditions, overpopulation, and I'm not saying the, the causal relationship between those two is a complicated story which we will, we will get to, but that nexus of, you, you always see, whenever you see incredibly dense populations, you always see this kind of poverty and the kinds of things that people undergo. You know, you have, I was trying to put myself in the mind of a parent, you know, what kind of a situation are they in that they sell their, their daughters to fairly certain death. And uh, 
the situation is as I've described to you. Now, even though I saw this as a huge, as a very large phenomenon, uh, I've never seen this in, the, in any literature. I've never seen an academic paper about it. I've never seen a newspaper story about it. Uh, it's not discussed in demographic circles and uh, some public health circles, which I'm aware of. I, I, it, it just isn't, isn't brought up. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, I was not a, a scholar of this thing. And I said, have I misremembered this? You, you very frequently misremember things. Have I blown up? Did I see one or two cases and have somehow aggrandized it? I eventually, after telling the story quite a bit, even in the early runnings of this class, I started doubting that this, you know, that somehow I, I, why such a big thing? Why wasn't it shown? And one year I decided, okay, this is the last year. I'm not going to tell this story again because, you know, I don't have any references for it. And everything I, I say, I try to, you know, a student comes to me, I can give you a reference. And you can see in the notes a lot of things have little references, which you probably can't read, but if you e call me or email me, I'll tell you what that little scribble means. Anyway, at the end of that lecture, actually it was about two lectures later, because uh, there was an exam coming up right after that. After more than this class, in previous years, students used to come up and we used to spend half an hour, an hour discussing whatever they want to discuss. And one girl stayed by the side. And then when everybody is gone, she came up to me, a little bit shy, and said, thank you for telling that story. My mother was one of those girls. And she, what she knew from her mother was basically what I had said. But the difference was that this was her bio biological mother, and this wasn't an abandoned girl. She said she remembered being in the hospital with all girls basically at the mother, I'm sorry, I, I just didn't. so I said, oh my gosh, you know, would your mother come to class and describe what this situation was like? And, the, and yes, the mother was in fact a professor at a, at a college in New Jersey, not Princeton. And she came up here and, and, and described it, and again, described it in great detail, you know, more or less as, as, as I have uh, described it. And she said that when she was in the hospital, uh, she saw all the other little girls who were more or less the same age, same medical problem. And she said, as a, as a little girl, she always wondered why their parent, their mother, didn't come to visit them, why their parents didn't come to visit them. She was one of the few whose, whose mother, and I guess the father, I don't really remember that detail, did come to visit. <coughs> well, the doctors kind of noticed that this girl had a bio parent, and so they took her out of the big ward and put a lot of incredibly special effort into this one girl. And eventually she uh, got the, the bacteria out of her and survived. She was, uh, uh, you know, walked like this, missing a hip and had a fair number of, of sequelae from the bone uh, TB. <coughs> uh, but she, mi uh, she got cured, uh, grew up, managed to mi get educated, migrate to America and became a professor at, a, at a, as I say, a college in New Jersey and had a daughter at Yale taking this course. So it's one of the miracle stories, uh, but yeah, I'm convinced now that I didn't dream this stuff up. Okay, so that's really my personal motivation. That started my per personal motivation for being, doing all this uh, course stuff. Now, uh, What's the word we describe for this era of the 60s? The population explosion. Why do we use the word explosion? It's a rather uh, you know, emotive kind of word. And it's for this reason, that here is a somewhat fanciful recreation uh, of history. But we know it can't be very much different than this, because we, we start knowing what the populations were here. So we, you put in some sort of a reasonable growth rate, and the population's going to look like that. The only thing you can really see is the Black Death. Then, as we've talked about in, in this class, starting roughly in the 1700s, population just takes off. And you've heard of exponential population growth. And you may or may not know what that means, but what it precisely means is there's a certain rate of growth, a certain percent per year, and each year the population grows by that same percent. 1% a year, 2% a year, 3% a year. But the percentage growth is constant. The numbers of people added every year grows, because the base grows. But the percentage added every year is constant. 
That's exponential growth. In fact, during this period, in fact, during most of this period, the percentage rate of growth has been increasing. And it increased from somewhere out here of you know, 0.001% to then 0.01, 0 0.1. And in this period, it went up to uh, to even 3% global, the whole world uh, population growth rate in this incredible uh, ex expansion. As you can sort of see again in this somewhat schematized uh, graph that the incredible rate of growth has slowed down a little bit. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means. But it's still growing uh, outrageous, or they project <coughs> that, it, that it should slow down. This is, we are now at about 6.7 uh, billion, so some of that graph is, is, is a projection. So you can call this kind of population growth hyper-exponential, where the, the rate, not only does the growth get faster in an exponential wa way, but the rate of growth itself grows, so it's hyper-exponential growth. Now there's a, a, the whole issue of population growth is very politicized. Uh, uh, some people don't think that we should pay is no problem. Some people think we should don't, don't do anything about it. Some people think it's too politically sensitive uh, to, to say anything about it. And in this discussion, one of the things you hear is, oh, the world's population has been growing for a long time. We've been able to cope with it. Uh, our economics is, is wonderful. We can in, we've industrialized. The population has been growing and people have been getting richer, and that is certainly true. Since Malthus wrote, the population has multiplied many times, and yet these mass, mass starvations have not happened. In fact, not only as the population has grown, people have gotten richer. So they say, we've coped with this in the past, we can cope with it in the future. The problem is that this is unprecedented, that we don't really have any significant length of history for something like this. So anybody who tells you that they, have, they know what's going to happen in the future is just, <laughs> is just ignorant. This is absolutely in just unknown territory. Unknown territory doesn't mean I'm not saying you know, it's going to absolutely be a disaster or it's absolutely going to be fine. It's just that we have no way of, of predicting basically anything with a population growing like that. Uh, up to a few years ago, basically nobody predicted all the environmental, for instance, nobody predicted all the environmental problems that we're having now. That came uh, essentially out of the blue. <coughs> now, this is a, a schematized thing. Here's kind of a, a more cartoonish kind of, uh, e even more cartoonish, but it doesn't go quite so far back, so it's a little bit better data here. And again, showing the same thing. This was, uh, you were here, this was drawn in 2004. We're now uh, in 2008, and we're about 6.7. So in, in the, just the four years since this was made, we're still on this trajectory. No, nothing very unexpected has happened. Here is the, uh, the US Census Bureau uh, projection, uh, uh, updated December 2008, so it's as recent as you can find, for what's happened, they, they do 100 years. And you may notice 3 billion, 4 billion, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, just keeps going, and out at the end, they're predicting a little bit of fall off, but one doesn't know that <coughs> by 2040, they're expecting 9 billion people and still growing. So there's no, well, you've heard a lot about, you know, uh, Europe and, and Michael Teitelbaum gave you a lecture on the low population growth rates in Europe, in Japan, and in, in quite a number of countries in the world. And that's correct that the Population growth is extremely unbalanced in the world. The, the developed countries are having zero to at most 5% of the increase. They're growing at 0.1%, you know, whereas some of the poorer countries are still growing at 2 3%. So I'll show you in a minute that basically all of this growth is in the poorer countries where they least least, have the least resources to cope with this amount of growth. <coughs> now, here is... Uh, the, the population change in millions, and we'll see that that has basically been growing. This is where we are now. It basically grew up to 1990. It's fallen off a little bit 
here, and then it's predicted to keep growing for another uh, few years, and then it's predicted to go down here. I emphasize guesswork. I, this was not on the original. This is data, we have <laughs> fairly decent reason, but again, there's error bars on here, and we don't know what those error bars, uh, how big they should be. And this is really guesswork. The guesswork is not too bad for the near future, because the, 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 the women who are going to have these children are already born, they're already close to maturity. Uh, we know that uh, fertility rates generally don't change all that fast, although I will show you plenty of exceptions to that in the next lecture. So you can maybe more or less believe the next dozen years here, or something <coughs> like that. And then uh, you make various projections, and I'll show you those projections can be almost anything because we don't have a very good basis uh, for that. But the near-term projection that the number of people added every year is going to go up is probably uh, pretty accurate because it's very near-term. And now, <coughs> again, what do the, uh, the optimists take that data? that here's the number of people added, and you see it has been going up, it's kind of jiggling around, it may or may not decline in the future, but because the base has been growing, because the population keeps growing, if the same number of people are added every year, then the percentage increase goes down. So when you hear a lot of optimism about the population situation, what they're talking about is that the, uh, that the peak rate of growth here in the 1960s has come down as a percentage of the base. But as you just saw, since the base is growing, the number, absolute actual number of people added is not <coughs> changed all that much. And again, we're growing, the world is growing something like one and, uh, one and a quarter percent, one, one to one and a half percent a year currently, and the guesswork is, and the hope is, that will continue down. In fact, the, this, this uh, continued decrease is based on some pretty optimistic assumptions. And, uh, well, I'll just, we may get time to talk about them later, but fertility has been falling. If you presume that fertility has fallen as far as it's going to fall, and now it's going to stay constant, so the most conservative projection is constant fertility. Whatever we are at now, that's the way it's going to be. <coughs> then you don't get anything like this. You get a, a huge uh, takeoff. This presumes that fertility will keep falling until people have two children uh, per family, and fairly rapidly. And uh, that's a nice guess, a nice prediction, but we really have essentially no, theori no decent theoretical basis to uh, presume that. Now here is the one number you should really keep in your mind. This is right up to date. This is the Census Bureau uh, 2009. This gives you the world events, and it just, for being kind of cute, it breaks it down to how much is the increase each year. Month, day, you can do it down to the second. And notice, and I, and I gave you these numbers last time in, as ratios, as per thousand. This is the number of births. Oh, man. This is the number of births per year, 135 million, and the number of deaths, 55 million. So that's the difference. That's the population growth rate. 80 million people. So that's, I think that's one of the key numbers to just keep in mind. Round it off, 80 million, that the increase every year on Earth now is 80 million, and it's been uh, roughly that for uh, quite some time. The, uh, the maximum here was something like 90 million, not, not quite 90 million, and now we're just about 80 million. So when people say, oh, the birth, everything's coming down, things are getting better, we're going to come to a soft landing, well, what we actually know is the difference between 87 million and 80 million <coughs> with large and unknown error bars, so it might not be a decrease at all. I mean, we just don't know, but nothing drastic has happened to engender such uh, optimism about the future uh, of human population, although you will hear that over and over and over again. Now, um, as, as I showed you, this, this graph that uh, we are here at, at the, uh, at the, about actually here, 
to 6.7 billion, and all of the projections show it to continue to increase. Again, the rate of increase gets fuzzier and fuzzier as you go further out in time, but it will increase, and uh, the projections are that by 2040 will be 9 billion and still growing. So we're adding a billion at 80 million a year, we're adding a billion every 12 and a half uh, years, if uh, it falls a little bit, we'll add a billion every 13 years or every 14 years. And what's to keep in mind in, when you think of those numbers, so that's a billion people every 12, 13, 14 years, pick whatever number you like. And think of everybody's green. Anybody green in this class? Anybody not green? Are you environmentalists? <laughs> yes. Who's an anti-environmentalist? <laughs> Hooray, one, two. <laughs> right here. Well, I'm going to return to this theme, but uh, they can't be repeated uh, enough times, that think of the environmental footprint of a billion extra people every dozen or so years, a billion extra people. Now add up all the environmentalism, all the achievements of this wonderful environmental movement, uh, it's a wonderful thing, and it pales in comparison that, that you know, it's just we're playing a losing battle with the environment. As long as we're growing at a billion people in so many years, we're not going to solve uh, the environmental problems no matter what we, we do. It's just too, too great an increase of people. And yet, environmentalists generally never talk about uh, human population. It's too politically dangerous uh, to talk about that. Hence, this course is one of the very few uh, in, in the country or anywhere in the world that, that really hits, talks about population uh, straight on. Okay, so why do we, uh, why are we, why are we, why is everybody projecting that the population is going to I keep increasing there? And it's simply you look at the age structure and something like uh, half of the world's population uh, is under 15 years old, i.e. just coming in. Uh, I'm sorry, a third of the world's population is under 15 years old, and so just coming into reproductive ages, and we know that for the next they will come into reproductive ages and then be of reproductive potential for the following 30 years. And we know that this increasing number of now 10 to 15 year olds who will be coming into reproductive ages will keep the population uh, increasing. So it's certain that it will increase, although the rate of increase and, and, and how it changes is certainly uh, less certain. So, but it's under almost any kind of reasonable assumption, uh, the population is going to grow uh, another several billion uh, people. And so again, you know, we're in unprecedented territory. Most people think the Earth right now is incredibly stressed and it is environmental things, uh, situation, and now add another couple of billion uh, people to that uh, in the near future and, s and see what's going on. So since we don't have crystal balls, the students usually ask me the question, what's going to happen? And I always have to say, oh, I left my crystal ball in my closet. <laughs> you know, I didn't, didn't bring it today. I, I, I do not have, have a way into the future. But anybody who tells you they know what's going to happen in the future, and especially if they're going to be optimistic about it, is a very blind uh, kind of person. <coughs> okay, so you've all heard discussions of the, the population problem. And it's really two different problems. Uh, the first a problem, which in the West we're very cognizant of, is overconsumption by rich people. A, very, a good fraction of the world is now what you should definitely call rich. And they consume like crazy, and a lot of what we consume is frivolous, like Hummers and great big, you know, some, some little person driving this great big SUV that they never carry anything heavy, and they certainly don't have to drive over logs or something which an SUV is actually good for. So the overconsumption uh, depletes the world's resources, uh, increases pollution, destruction of habitat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So environmental misery is largely caused by rich people consuming profligately, unnecessarily and, and profligately. The other side of the coin is uh, poverty. You have the world is definitely split, and the split is getting wider uh, between poverty and, and over 
people who <coughs> overconsume, and their problem, of course, is underconsumption, and they lead to all of the, the, the problems of poverty, which I've discussed in Hong Kong, and you, I don't have to tell you very much about what the problems in the world with poor people are. So we have these two opposite problems, what I call environmental misery and human misery. And they're both very largely a result of too rapid population growth that, the, that we, we might, in some utopian scenario, eventually be able to cope with, say, the population levels that we have now, maybe. Uh, but at the rate of growth, it's obvious, just looking around you, that our technology, our economy, our governments have not been able to cope uh, with this so far. So it's very interesting, as, as, a, as a political note, that there are these two faces of, of the population problem, the environmental problem and, the, and the, the people misery problem. And it's amazing how people focus on one or the other. There's people like in, in work in Planned Parenthood and various uh, feminist and women's organizations. They're interested in, in people misery. They always talk about poverty and the attendant problems. Then there's environmentalists, and they worry about trees and the survival of animals and forests and, and, and nature. And both are, of course, very important and very uh, good causes to work on, but it is absolutely mind-boggling how rarely you find anybody that sort of is really in any way concerned about both problems, or in any way realizes how population is the centerpiece uh, of both of these problems. Okay, so let me uh, talk just a little bit about overconsumption, and uh, who's the number one bad guy in overconsumption? We are. <laughs> right, so here's the story for, uh, some of the story for the United States. This is um, uh, the, 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 the growth of the United States population from 1900 to 2000. We, in 1900, had about 75 million. And in 2006, uh, this, yeah, that's 2000, 2000. So in 2006, we passed 300 million people. And uh, that's a quadrupling, that our population has quadrupled in uh, that one century. We were almost like an underdeveloped country in our population growth rate. And that is up to the almost current. And here is, again, the latest Census Bureau thing from, uh, again, this was, uh, I just got it out of the computer last night, actually, the latest numbers, that here's the, the standard, one of the standard things is give you a 100-year time frame. Currently, they're using 1950 to 2050, and we are, as you know, sort of right about <coughs> here. And here's the U.S. population <coughs> growth rate, and just almost a perfectly straight line. There is no prediction that the U.S. is going to uh, slow down in its uh, population uh, growth rate. We are growing at about 3 million a year, or it's currently that's 1% of the year, uh, of a year, and because of, of natural increase, that's births over deaths of people already in America, plus immigration, we're just going up uh, here. And, um, in our population growth rate, it's about two-thirds uh, births over deaths of citizens already here, and about one-third immigration. And of immigration, uh, the guesses are that it's about two-thirds legal and one-third illegal. The obviously, the <coughs> illegal is an enormous <coughs> guess, the, the absolute number, the percentage of anything that it is. If you look at how they come up with these numbers, it's really seat of the pants. So we don't know very much about the magnitude of uh, illegal immigration, but it's an enormous political uh, issue. Now, on the consumption side, uh, of course, we consume so much, and again, numbers vary kind of wildly, but the range of numbers are that an, an American consumes something between 20 and 40 times <coughs> what a person in a developing uh, country will consume. So if you multiply the th our 3 million population growth a year by a consumption factor of 20, that's equivalent to the, a growth, population growth of 60 million poor people. And so you do it that way, it looks like that our population growth uh, is as damaging to the resource and, and environmental situation in the world as the whole rest of the world uh, put together. 
Uh, and that's just considering our population increase, not the population base, which is also consuming at this great rate. So we are, indeed, it is certainly correct that we are uh, a tremendous strain on, on the environment and resources <coughs> of the Earth. And as I showed, it's not getting better. Our, our population is just increasing. Now, you have to balance against that that a lot of our population growth is, of course, people coming in from other countries. So that it's not, in some sense, Americans who are getting richer, but it's poor people coming in and, and getting richer. But you can play these numbers in all different ways, and, and we'll, we'll talk about the politics in a moment. But the, the U.S. Census Bureau used to say that we will reach, that the U.S. population will reach 300 million by the year 2050. We reached that number 44 years earlier than the Census Bureau thought, <laughs> and we are still growing. And now the Census Bureau says there is no sign of stabilization at all. They cannot give you a number at which they think the U.S. population will stabilize because <coughs> as far out as anybody can, can project, there's no reason to believe that stabilization in view. <coughs> now, some of the argumentation is that, you again, people, this very political issue, and uh, half the people say, it's all those poor people that are over-reproducing. Can't they learn some self-control? And then people say, all those Americans and, and, and Japanese that consume like crazy, can't they use some self-control? And it's an extremely sterile argument that goes on and on. People don't think beyond you know, two or three sentences in, into that uh, argument. And uh, as I tell you, if you do it out numerically, the, the, the increasing damage is, is, is more or less equal. And it depends more critically as as Americans usually blame, our, blame ourselves that we're the problem, there's a very kind of, sh um, I don't want to call it, use the word racist, but a, but a very euro america centric argument that, because the presumption is, when it says, well, we're the consumers and poor, uh, the poor people we don't have to worry about, is that they will stay poor. It's a Western assumption that poor people are going to stay poor, and they're not, not only are they not consumers now, but they're never going to be consumers. <laughs> And that is just nonsense. And we've seen now the Chinese have come up enormously, the Indians have come up enormously, the Indonesians have come up enormously. Uh, everywhere in the world, these vast numbers of poor people are now, star now starting to be serious consumers. And I think the, the CO2 uh, production in China, I think, has just in, uh, out outpaced the United States, but I didn't, <coughs> I did, I didn't look that up uh, uh, recently. And so they're an equal problem. So if one gets out of one's head the <coughs> idea that poor people are going to stay poor forever, uh, which, which is an, a pre-globalization idea, now a worker in China can compete with a worker in America, and eventually there's going to be some leveling. So I think the, the proper thing is if you think there are too many people on Earth for either human misery issues or environmental misery issues or both, any birth you should consider more or less equal. Uh, preventing a birth in, in America, in Japan, in Indonesia, everywhere, that in the not too distant future, these people are going to be more or less equal. And we'll see, we'll, we'll see in next lecture what the people themselves want with respect to this thing. But I hope after this course that none of you get involved in the sterile argument of us versus them. You know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Okay. But in the world as it is today, uh, <coughs> most of the almost all of the population growth is in the poorest countries. Uh, again, statistics are pretty bad, but something like 95% of population growth in the world are in the poorest countries. And as you know, new people need uh, schools, they need health care, they need a place to live, they need jobs, and all of this takes money, takes capital, and that's what the poor countries are missing. They don't have uh, the capital. They usually don't have the technological expertise. They don't have the, often the quality of government that can cope with these enormous problems. So it's, it's the places that are least capable of coping with a population increase that are, in fact, saddled with it. And the magnitude of this growth uh, is, is incredible. Uh, as far as that as we can project, uh, 
the poor countries are going to have to build a city equivalent of one million people, uh, one million, a city to, to, to cope with a million people every week for the next 45 years, which is as far as we project it. And if you look at, you know, you know the big cities, Shanghai, Beijing, and China, just pick almost any name <laughs> and go to an almanac and you'll see the, there's, there's so many mega million cities in China that, you know, cities even that I've never heard of, and you look up their population, they're in, in the millions. And a place like New York with seven million people I is nothing. So Sweden, where I, I lived in Sweden for a while, uh, has like seven to eight million people. New York City has seven to eight million people. Cities in China, that's, that's, that's a small town uh, almost, and, and India is not, not far behind. So people in the United States generally don't have uh, much of an idea of, of what poverty really looks like. And one of the best descriptions of this comes from uh, Bill Ryerson, who is going to be a guest lecturer later. And he describes flying into Bombay. And this is, again, a, a few years back, but in this period of extreme population explosion that, that we're talking about. Go to the airport, and the airport is way outside the city, <coughs> as, as all airports have to be. And <coughs> by the international flight schedules, they come in early in the morning. So he starts driving in, and almost immediately at the airport, you start seeing uh, poor people begging on the street. You see uh, shanties uh, that, that people are living in. And when it comes into the denser places, people start begging, and you see very commonly a mother holding an infant, and you can look, the infant is clearly nearly dead. And uh, the mother's, you know, please give me something, anything, so I can keep this child alive uh, till tomorrow. And there's one after the other after the other. And it gets denser. And then the, the sun comes up and it gets warm. India is generally a, a rather warm country. And there's all these uh, jitneys and motorbikes, and trucks, <coughs> small trucks putting around. And they don't have good catalytic converters. Those are expensive. So a lot of them have platinum in them. So they produce a lot of pollution, and the air gets very thick with this black uh, smoke very early, uh, black soot, whatever you want to call it, in, in, in the early morning. So you're not breathing fresh air. And then, of course, they have no toilets uh, around, and you're going to read some articles about uh, what that means. And so very soon, the stench of human waste, you're on the main streets going into the main city, uh, the stench of human waste uh, comes up at you, and uh, it smells terribly, and the more and more beggars. And it's just, you know, an heart, absolutely heart-wrenching uh, a, a, a description of, of what's going on. And then you think that here are millions and millions of people that, uh, ha you know, will, will never have a real house. They live in some cardboard shack uh, somewhere. Uh, they'll never have a real job. Uh, they'll never probably uh, go to the bathroom in a toilet and they may never even breathe a, a breath of, of fresh air. Um, so it, poverty is really a, a very, very serious uh, kind of situation. And, and uh, you can go to lots and lots of cities in the world and, and, and see similar kinds uh, of, of descriptions. How to do the numbers on this poverty. So we compare it to the United States. So General Motors, before its recent demise, these numbers are three or four years old. The to so they pay wages to the workers, then they have health benefits, which you've read about is very high because they pay them for the rest of the life, and they pay pensions. So when you add all that up, how much lifetime they're going to pay for a worker and divide it by the number of hours the worker works, it comes out for, for General Motors was $80 an hour. That the wages, General Motor worker, $80 an hour. And, uh, that was a, somewhere near a maximum for union wages, not counting like airline pilots who get a, an awful lot more than that. The upper middle class, uh, that's blue collar workers at GM. The upper middle class uh, people mostly in this room are going to be earning an awful lot uh, more than that. On the other hand is the poverty level, uh, which for a, a, a family of a mother, father, and three children is defined as uh, um, $24,000 a year, that's the 2006 number, uh, the official U.S. number, which is $13.35 a day per person. That's the poverty level as officially defined 
in the United States. <coughs> Walmart, uh, a worker, a sales associate, earns $6.10 an hour or $12,000 a year. Uh, $6 an, uh, uh, an hour, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> is $12,000 a year. They are below poverty level. So the next step up for a Walmart worker is, po is official poverty level. When you go to developing countries, you have to cut, to, to get any idea of a scale, you have to cut the Walmart, Walmart wages in at least a factor of four. So Walmart uh, makes uh, its pants in El Salvador, and the pants sell, for this particular article on this, $16.95 in their United States stores. And how much do you think the women uh, in El Salvador get who make the pants per pant? 15 cents is, is the wage level uh, that they, they get for it. <coughs> the UN reported that about half of the world's workers, which is about 1.4 billion people, uh, earn less than $2 a day. So the average wage, the median wage in the world is something like $2 a day. That's per wage earner, not per family, not per person, but per wage earner. And that then has to be divided among however many dependents uh, that person has. You have told you that what the U.S. sets uh, its official level for poverty. Every country in the world, of course, gets to decide its own level of what poverty is. And the official poverty level in the poorest 10, 10 to 20, poorest 20 countries is $1.25. You're only poor if you earn less than $1.25 per capita per day. In both China and India, the official poverty level is closer to $1 a day. And this is at 2005 prices again. Statistics are always a couple of years behind things. <coughs> in rich places like Latin America and Eastern Europe, uh, $2 a day is the more appropriate uh, poverty level. And that is for all the developing countries, $2 a day is the median and their own <coughs> self-defined uh, poverty level. <coughs> but within each country and each region, uh, there's great inequality, of course, in income. So uh, about a third of the people in Latin America are living on less than $2 a day. Two-thirds of the people in Pakistan live on less than two -thirds, uh, $2 a day. Uh, more than 58% of the population in Kenya lives on less than $1 uh, a day. Brazil, 25% of the people on less than $1 a day. The whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, 44% of the people on less than $1 a day. And so, and it's not only these, you know, traditionally poor countries, but in Romania, uh, after the Soviet bloc fell apart, 40% of the people live on less than one dollar a day. <coughs> Indonesia had a had a government work program so that people could get some uh, kind of work, and laborers got 75 cents a day for five hours of work a day. That's 15 cents an hour, and I don't know how much it, how much time it takes to sew Walmart pants, but maybe an hour, uh, probably less, but so 15 cents an hour is a wage that for many people in a place like Indonesia, which is a lot of oil, it's not a overall necessarily a poor place, 15 uh, uh, cents uh, an hour for an hour's work, 75 cents a day. And that's much more than they can get working, you know, getting agricultural jobs around where they live. Uh, so here's a description uh, from Z Zambia. <coughs> a nine-year-old boy, Alone Banda, his job is to beat rock fragments into powder. He doesn't have a hammer. He found a large steel bolt from some construction site. He found a bolt. He grips in his bare hand and pounds the rock with it. He takes raw rock, takes a bolt that he found, and, and, and pounds with it. And he can fill, it takes him about a, uh, in a week, he can fill about a half a bag uh, with this powder, which is used uh, for construction, and he gets about a dollar fifty for uh <coughs> the half bag, and it's used for making concrete in in, in Kenya, for instance. Uh, children start working at five or six. We we saw we talked about 
Uh, Charles Dickens, who so much of his writing was about children going to work at age seven. Well, seven is old, they go to five or six, and they work as prostitutes even at that age, miners, construction workers, pesticide strayers, and all the kinds of dangerous and, and, and miserable jobs. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's something like 48 million children, 14 and younger, who, who are working. And four years later, these are says 2000, by 2004, it had increased by 1.3 million. So the number of children working in these poverty level jobs is increasing because the whole population is increasing, and, and so forth. And this is the poverty rates uh, around the world. And just compare, uh, this confirms the numbers that I'm telling you, that uh, these are the, the head count, the number of millions, uh, a percent below poverty line, $1.25 a day, less than $2 a day. And if you take out China, uh, China is still one of the poorest places when you add in all, all the peasants. It doesn't get, uh, it gets some, <coughs> actually China makes it worse. When you add in China, you have a higher percentage at, at these uh, poverty levels. Same for whatever poverty level you want to work. <coughs> these are the appropriate poverty levels uh, for developing countries. Um, now, again, you have the same two ways of describing this. The absolute number of people in this kind of poverty is growing up. As the whole population grows, the number of people in these levels are growing up. Yet there has been economic progress in the sense that, as a percentage of people, the poverty numbers are going down. So there's more people in poverty, but there's a lesser percentage of the total population in poverty. So again, you can, depending on your political orientation, you can describe this as you know, an increasingly bad situation where more and more people are in this kind of poverty, or a situation that is getting better because the percentage of people in poverty is, is going down. <laughs> now, the miracle. So you've all heard of the economic miracle uh, in East Asia especially. <coughs> and anybody come fairly recently from China? No, none of the students come from China. Well, the average income, and again, <coughs> big problem how you define, of course, the Chinese don't earn dollars, so when you express it in dollars, there's a translation. And the best way of doing it is what's called PPP, purchasing power parity. One way is to use the official exchange rate. How many, you know, they earn so many yuan, and how many dollars can they buy with that yuan? But that exchange rate, as you know, especially in China, is manipulated by the government and is not a real number. So a number that makes the Chinese income look more favorable and is close to a real number is what they call purchasing power parity. You say, how much does a sack of rice cost in China? How much does it cost in the United States? And you try to use a basket of commodities appropriate to what the people in that country actually use and say, how much would that cost in dollars? So you can have a, a, a parity. And on that kind of a level, uh, a Chinese peasant on average earns a dollar a day lives, uh, the person, every per a dollar a day is the average <coughs> income in a Chinese peasant family. The jobs in the modern sector, which means one of these manufacturing jobs, and they, they migrate to some city, they live in these dorm rooms where they're just stacked li like cordwood and they have basically no free time and they're, it's, it's a miserable life, but they double their income. The economic miracle in Asia is when people go from one dollar a day <coughs> to two dollars a day. And there's hundreds of millions of people, you add up China and India, hundreds of millions of people who are desperate to earn two dollars a day. It's a doubling of their income. And when you read these horrible stories, horrible to our ears, of, of how especially women moving into the big cities, uh, Guangzhou, can the old Canton, or any of the big cities, how they're living and what the conditions they're working under, remember, it a, represents a doubling of their income. And it's so much that they send, they can send most of that back to their home village. And the home villages are all living on this kind uh, of, of income. And so when we talk about, po we will later talk about population in China, you now must realize that basically all of those workers who now have access to moderately decent education can compete with us. There's very few jobs that we can do and they can't do. And so we at 
up to $80 an hour for a blue collar worker are basically in competition with, some, with someone who's very happy, and, and they grumble. People working for GM grumble, at, and some of their conditions, the, the grumbling could be quite fair, uh, but they're in competition with people earning $2 a day, that wish they would earn uh, $2 a day. And in places, in, and this is not only our competition, but jewelry making, very labor intensive. Of course, uh, countries with low wage rates attract very labor intensive jobs, and hand making <coughs> of jewelry is a very labor intensive job. And it turned out that Bangkok was one of the centers of jewelry making. And because it was a center and it requires a fair amount of skill, the wages actually rose in Bangkok for the jewelry makers. And they got up to $8 a day for a jewelry worker in Bangkok. And guess what happened? All the factories moved to China, go back down to $2 a day. A saving of 75% on your labor costs. Of course they're going to do it. And not only China, but Mexico, all the maquilladoras, the, uh, the, the border between Texas and California and, and Mexico has a lot of factories. And because of various trade laws, they can assemble things and just ship them across the border with, with low, uh, low trade tariffs and everything. And they have been nearly wiped out with jobs moving to China. And now, of course, for a while anyway, the conditions were getting a little bit better to China. So the jobs moved to, you've been reading your newspapers? Who's now competing with China? One, India at a high level, but Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, places that are even poorer than China are now even taking jobs away from China. In Romania, which is one of the poorest countries in Europe, the, the wages average about $83 a week in Europe, so $10, uh, 10 $12 uh, a day. <coughs> when they got into the European Union, what did the Romanian workers do? <laughs> they moved out to France, Germany, England to get the higher wages that are, that are available there, which left a lot of jobs unfilled in Romania, where they get $12 a day, as I've just said. So what did the Romanians do? Imported Chinese who worked for less and, and filled the jobs. There's an unlimited number of peasants in China that would love to work in Romania under almost any kind uh, of, of conditions. And they leave their husbands, their children, everybody is left home, uh, usually under the care of grandparents who are too old uh, themselves to work. So keep that in mind. Abject poverty is a dollar a day the economic miracle is $2 a day. OK. What does living look like in these places? Well, we've been talking about Bombay and Shanghai. These are big places that everybody knows about. You'll never guess where this is, and you've probably never heard of it. This is the capital of Mauritania. How many know where Mauritania is? Oh, good. It's on the Atlantic coast of Africa. I should remember to always make slide gra uh, geography, you know, map slides, but I didn't. It's on the Atlantic coast. It is the, the capital is a place called Nouakchott. Nouakchott is over there somewhere, <laughs> and this is the suburbs of Nouakchott. And what it is is desert. <coughs> it's in, uh, all of Mauritania is basically a desert until it rolls into the ocean, in which case it becomes an ocean. And so in the desert, all these people live in uh, shanties of any, any kind of construction material uh, they, can, they can find. Uh, the national government, the city government, does not have the resources to deal with these people at all. So they get no sanitation. They get no policing. They get no water. Uh, they, there's just, these are called unplanned communities, and they sort of basically don't exist. But what are they to the government? They're a source of problem because very poor people who have nothing to lose revolt every so often. They say, you know, you've got something, we don't have it, we want it, why is the government not doing for anything? So this is a, a, a source of social discontent, and the, and the shanty towns around every big city in the world are great sources of social <coughs> discontent. So what you see here is a road, and I've just said they basically don't have roads. What happens is that the military in each of these countries wants to be sure to be able to control the people. So every so often they send in a bulldozer. You can sort of see another road here off to the right. You get a better one of these. Uh, 
they, they, uh, they just come in one morning and the people are asleep in their, their shanties because they don't have any jobs. Uh, and very early in the morning they just hear this rumble. And they walk outside to find out what it is and the bulldozer is two minutes away from, from their house and they just go down and knock out anything <coughs> that's, that's in the way. If, if you happen to be in the path that the, bulldo the military bulldozer uh, knocks down, uh, sorry, sorry, that's gone. And then the soldiers can, can uh, go into these uh, situations. <coughs> so the, the point being that these enormous dense populations, which we associate with Calcutta or Bombay or Shanghai, Canton, you know, are in fact almost everywhere in, in the world now, including this, oh, sorry, this is, this is where Nouakchott uh, meets the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Atlantic Ocean there. God, this is terrible. And what do they live on? Well, they live on fishing. And each of these little things here that you can see is a fishing boat, a little boat that they row out and fish. And look at how many boats there are all trying to get the occasional fish. And that's not a terribly rich uh, fishing ground of the world. It's very close to the equator, <coughs> and there's no big upwelling of nutrients, so there's not a great big uh, fishing ground there. But this is how uh, the, the, the people live, competing with each other for the few fish uh, that are out there. <coughs> now, so that's the desert, and here's the jungle. <coughs> so this is Brazil, and a place that you may have heard of, Serra Pelada. <coughs> Peeled Mountain or Naked Mountain. And anybody has heard of it or seen pictures of this before? One couple of people. It's very well known. So if you travel in Brazil, all the big cities again have shanty towns where people are desperate for some kind of a job. <coughs> so every so often a truck rolls through and says, I have some jobs, and people just pile in. And I, I watch it and they sort of don't ask how much, where am I going, what's the, what the kind of work. A job is like a, a magic word, it's like manna from heaven. They, they jump in the truck. <coughs> well, one of the places they're taken to is this place. And this place is way in the, in the middle of the jungle, like a thousand miles from Rio or Sa San Paulo. And what it is, it's a mountain that they found gold in. And normally, if you've seen like mining in the <coughs> west of the United States, <coughs> you know, they have these steam shovels which have a bucket as big as this whole room, probably. And they each, each drag of the bucket uh, pulls up, you know, hundreds of tons, I, I don't know the actual numbers. In Serapilada, uh, human labor is cheaper than, uh, than to, to buy a, a, a steam shovel. So what each of these little dots are is a person. And what it is, this is a pit, and they're digging in the mud there. They carry the mug up. The sluicing is up here on, on the top where they have, you know, sluicing is gold is heavier than, than soil, so they take basically mud dump it into a place, water runs over it, washes away the mud, and anything that sticks down falls heavy, is little flakes or, or little tiny nuggets of gold. That's the primitive way of doing gold <coughs> mining. You just flow water over mud, and there's very, very low concentration, you get a gold flake there. So what are these people, <coughs> how do they work? This is, they go down, they climb, these are uh, wooden ladders, and another part, they climb down the ladders, and they have uh, burlap sacks on their back, the cheapest kind of sack, and they go down, and with very primitive implements, or maybe the hands, they take the, the earth from the bottom of the pit, they put it in these packs, they put the pack on their back, and they climb up the stairs and dump it into the sluice apparatus, and then go back down. That's their, their whole life there, with miserable wages. They can't leave because they're in the middle of the jungle. They have no way of getting back to any kind of civilization. The companies do indeed provide prostitutes for them. This whole village is full of prostitutes, which are the women that come out of the same situation. Send a truck around and say, I have jobs for women. They jump on with, with little or no uh, questions asked. And how is the whole thing kept under control? By soldiers with guns or paramilitaries with guns. And here is, uh, you know, moderately typical one of the workers has, has not even the clothes on his back, and there's you know huge numbers of them, and they are kept control. In this particular instance, the things were looking like they were going to go out of control. And again, uh, this this is this is all around the world. You find uh, situations like this. Uh, 
Sometimes I, I talk about, you know, it's everywhere in the world. Uh, if you go up to Mount Everest, so we've got, what are the ends of the earth? The, there's the deserts, there's the jungles, and there's Mount Everest. And I just copied down some statistics of Mount Everest. Just this is, you know, how much population there is in, in the world. Uh, there's uh, up, up high, and I, and I used to mountain climb a lot, a single footstep can require eight breaths. You take a step, you pant eight times, and people like me would be a lot more than eight, eight times. On one particular day, and standard in the couple of months that you can climb, there's 500 climbers waiting to, to climb up Everest. Uh, they, they, the place is just littered with dead bodies. It's littered with oxygen bottles. I mean, Mount Everest is kind of a congestion zone. It, it looks like a Grand Central Station that had been sort of cleared out of, of people uh, on many days. There's 120 dead bodies littering uh, the top of Mount Everest. So population has gotten so extreme that it's not only the big cities, it's basically everywhere that you look, uh, 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 people are. So let's just uh, conclude uh, today with a little bit uh, of future uh, guessing. So <coughs> we know that fertility, so now we have most of the world very high fertility rate, population going gangbusters. Now, can we dream up a scenario where this gets better. It may get better, it may not get better. You know, things may get to worse until there's some incredible crisis, or things may stay as they are now, or things may coast to a, to a soft landing. We don't know, but let's draw ourselves a scenario for the soft landing situation. So one of the things that we know is that there's very, very poor people, these dollar a day people, don't limit their births. And the exact reason for it, we'll discuss later, a lot of it has to do with education, that they don't, a lot of things about how their bodies work they don't understand, so they're, they're afraid of modern contraception. A lot of issues which, which we, will, uh, we will discuss. But we observe around the world that some increase in standard of living has to take place for for before people start uh, being willing and, and want to limit their fertility. So let's take the minimum situation. Let's say someone gets one of these $2 a day jobs. And that's then they start thinking differently about themselves in the world. There may be in a city where they get some education, some awareness of what's going on in the world. They want to limit their population. So let's say that we go from a dollar a day to two dollars a day. That's incredibly optimistic that two dollars a day is, is sufficient, but you'll see what, where I'm going. That's a doubling of income of the poor people. Again, something like a third of the people on Earth are in this one to two dollar a day range. So you double their income and uh, all of a sudden miracles happen, population stops growing. Not real, o way overly optimistic. Well, another thing that we know is that when incomes around the world rise, the poor people have the smallest rise and the rich people have the biggest rise. So if the small people are doubling their income, what is the, whole, the average of the whole world doing? It's gonna be much more than doubling. And again, you can pick uh, I'm sure economists have these numbers, I don't have them. You can pick whatever number you want. If in order to raise most of the world from $1 a day to $2 a day, we need to double their income, then does the whole world rises by more than two, maybe three. But we can pick any number that we want. So I've told you two facts, that the population of the world is for sure going to increase by something like 50% before, if and when it stabilizes. We can sort of see ballpark of 50% increase coming. And now, but this av average standard of living has to at least double and probably triple or quadruple or, you know, again, pick almost whatever number you want. So at the minimum of doubling the world's uh, per capita income, 50% uh, more people and doubling the income <coughs> means a three that, that the gross uh, economy of the world has to triple. Because you have one and a half times as many people, each earning twice as much. That's a tripling of the world economy. If you want to say that, uh, the world, that to, to double the, the income of poor people, you have to triple the whole wor world economy, then that's three times one and a half, or four and a half times as much. So basically, we're looking at an at a optimistic scenario for the future where we come to a soft landing. And then in order to come to a soft landing, we have to have the economy of the world increase by a factor of three, by a factor of four, four and a half, five, six, somewhere in that range of numbers. 
Now, technology, the improvement of technology allows us to grow our income without not a somewhat less than proportionate increase in resources. And again, you can make a wild guess about uh, how much technology will improve in the future so that we can double our income without quite doubling uh, the, the drain on the world's resources or the amount of pollution we put into it or the amount of carbon dioxide we put into it. So we're looking at this enormous increase. In order to come to a soft landing, we're looking at this at least a tripling of the world economy and something like a tripling of the pollution in the world, the carbon dioxide in the world, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the use of resources in the world. And most people believe that we're at the limit <coughs> of what the Earth can cope with in terms of the economy, which is basically how much we're taking out of the Earth. We're at the limit right now, but with population, we're not going to have a soft landing unless we triple that, at least, minimum, triple that. <coughs> so that's, that's the significance uh, of this population issue that, you know, can the Earth cope with a tripling of the economic activity on it? I left my crystal ball home, so you're gonna, you are definitely going to find out the answer to that question. Okay, next time we will continue. <laughs>